and it seems to all be about who are we really and what are we all doing in this place. So, I then had one of our sources order me the color Hasselblad. And lo and behold, not only is the geometry still there, but now you can see hazes and color and prismatic refractions and it all looks like it was a glittering glass structure beaten to death by micrometeorites still exposing the surviving geometry of those rectilinear rooms. In other words, an artificial arcology, an artificial structure on the moon. This got me really intrigued because now I'm back to this guy and I'm thinking to myself, is he so unhappy because he knows that that's what he and Schmidt really saw and photographed on the moon? And he knows because of that provision in Brookings where there is huge debate of whether discovering scientists, i.e. astronauts, can ever reveal this under the security classification laws that were at the formation of NASA, that even if we go back, even if the president's vision is fulfilled, there'll be the same stupid Petrick stuff and they will not tell us anything the new guys see. So it's basically, oh, same old, same old, you're going to keep lying and I'm not wanting any part of this. I mean, look at his expression because he was a guy who was there to physically see this. And if you read in the book, you'll see and read the transcript. There are so many hints in those transcripts of things that they did not reproduce, parts and elements of their conversation, where it's obvious they're amazed as hell by something they're seeing, and it ain't rocks, and they cannot communicate exactly what they've seen. So that will be something you have to look forward to toward the end of Dark Mission. Okay, so moving on, I now look at this in a new perspective because as we were putting the final draft of the book together and we're trying to figure out, okay, what do we leave in? What do we take out? What do we, can we talk about? You know, how do we write an epilogue that kind of brings everybody up to quasi, you know, where we are now given the publishing time schedules and you know, Dark Mission got done at the end on an accelerated time frame, so the stuff in the book is almost new. It's almost current in terms of things that have happened in the last few months. And I'm very proud that, you know, Adam Parfrey went along with that, and Mike and I were able to really give you something between covers as a hard copy version of all this that will stand the test of time circa, you know, November 2007. So I'm I'm, I'm, I'm in an in, in email with some of our colleagues, some of the people like Steve Troy, who is one of our invalued colleagues, lived in, lives in South Dakota, has been on this trail for years and years and years, and his whole story, you know, and how he got involved and what he's done for this project is in Dark Mission. And he sends me an email one day, and he says, I just got this interesting email from Italy. And he says, there's this guy over there that runs a website who claims that he's got original scan prints on his website from the Lunar Archive in Houston. Bing. My ears prick up, and I start looking at what he sent, and I go to the, to the website, and lo and behold, yes, there are some intriguing things. You know, it's on the borderline. It's like, okay, it could be something. It could be, you know, so much of this is ambiguous because they're trying to basically judge JPEG reproductions as opposed to getting TIFFs or getting uncompressed data. And you just can't do analysis with JPEGs. There's so many imaging artifacts that you can only use JPEGs to kind of confirm what you have from other sources. So I'm looking and I'm saying to myself, okay, where did this guy get his scans to put on his website? So I'm starting to look through the website for the source and I find this interesting Italian archive that's, I think, called Space, uh, Space Archive. And I go there, and, they, and the, whoever's doing this has organized the imagery they have posted by mission, by chronology, by month, by year. By, in other words, it's very well organized and is able to find anything from any mission. So I go to the Apollo 17 site, and I start looking at and downloading the source pictures for the other Italian guy who sent Steve 
a copy of an email because he knew from the web postings and enterprise that Steve was part of our team. And this is the photograph, among many, that I downloaded. This is now what I believe is the real version of this picture. Notice how incredibly light it is. Notice the scattering all over. This is an annotated version. This is in the book. You can actually read what everything here is. The, the fact is that there should be no blatant scattering. And over on the left of the picture, there's this incredible several thousand foot long curved something looking like a big long I-beam that had fallen out of the rafters, had bounced against this background, background mountain, and then it was lying there, bent at an angle, with part of it sticking up and the other part, the bottom, resting on the ground just beyond the visible horizon. And if we zoom in, you can actually see that the upper part has geometric structure, like a coupling or something, that came loose. You can see it sh it's kind of like a shard at the end there. It's been shattered or fractured. And all along the edge of this so-called mountain, there is what I call the prairie fire effect. There's stuff sticking up embedded like in this grid matrix. And overall, you see this overwhelming, let me back up one here. You see this overwhelming brightened grid, which is all over the photograph and has obviously, on the frames that have been released, carefully painted out by the same folks who Ken found that day back in 1971 who said, oh, we're eliminating the stars so the public won't be distracted. Now, this is absolutely amazing because it means that there could be tens of thousands of pictures of the real lunar stuff that's even brighter than I have thought it was, could be better preserved, could be more blatantly visible. For instance, here's another Apollo 17 shot. This is the raw version. This is the version which you brighten it up. This is A17-134-20454. Or this one. This is A17-134-20381. Here's the regular PR shot. Here's what happens when you brighten it and there's all kinds of gridded stuff in the sky. Here's AS17-134-20385. And here is this amazing curtain-like grid structure and the size and everything corresponds to not only what was photographed on Ken's shot, 9301, it corresponds to Firtek's reconstruction of his global grid over the lunar mare. And this, of course, is at the edge of Mare Serenitatis, which is one of the easternmost Mare visible on the front side, the Earth side of the Moon. Here's AS17-134-20417. Here's the normal shot, and here is the enhanced shot brightened up, showing again this vertical grid-like constructional stuff, which does not belong. One of the things that Fairtech didn't have time to do in his early reconstruction, which is like, what, 12 years ago now, is to compute what would happen if you had a differential effect on the light coming through the domes. That is, what would happen if instead of having light that was one wavelength, 